Greetings, everyone. Greg Archer here with the Esalen interview, where we connect with change agents, dive deep, and wonder on the edge a bit. Thank you for tuning in with us today. I'm really excited to connect with Esalen faculty Anne Randolph. Anne is an award-winning writer and producer. Her shows have been heralded by many, including the Washington Post, LA Times, and the San Francisco Chronicle, who wrote, you'll laugh, you'll cry, and mine's new depths of hilarity. Uh, Anne's show, Loveland, played to sold out audiences in LA and won the LA Weekly Award for Best Solo Show. It's brilliant, by the way. After the show, audience members would wait in the lobby to share their experiences of loss and grief. Themes touched upon in Anne's show with a bunch of absurdity and candor, in fact. Um, Anne also held a post-show interactive writing workshop on grief and loss. Uh, the incomparable Mel Brooks, the Mel Brooks, produced Anne's solo show, Squeezebox, which enjoyed a successful off-Broadway run before touring the U.S. and garnering more attention. Uh, there is so much to talk about with Anne, especially in a year when many of us might be fe feeling grief and loss and looking for levity and trying to find our way. So uh, please join me in welcoming Anne. Anne, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me, Greg. Absolutely. You've taught some writing workshops at Esalen and people love your work and love your style and it's great to connect with you here and and folks, uh, please leave some questions in the feed and I'll get to them as as uh, quickly as gracefully as I can. Uh, yeah. Hmm. And you are on Kauai at the moment. I'm in Kauai. We just made it through a hurricane. You made it through a hurricane. So, yes. <laughs> it did not touch down. It did not hit last night. I think uh, in a lot of ways, some of us are making our way through a hurricane. This is a curious year. It's so wild, so wild. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you're yeah. safe there. Me too, yeah. me too. Yeah, and I love your place. It's really awesome. Um, you know, I'm asking people, we have so much to share today, but I'm asking people who come on to the Esalen interview um, how this time has been for them. It's been a curious four or five months. First um, uh, with the pandemic and then uh, racial injustice coming to the forefront of um, everything. Um, but so how has this time been for you? Ah, well, I think like many, it's been a roller coaster ride of uh, emotion. And initially just the, I think it's shock. It's kind of like the stages of grief, you're in denial, like, oh, in three weeks, it'll be up and running again. You know, the country, the world will come back united. And so it's been uh, just one transition after another of feeling and just learning to ride those feelings. But uh, at first, I think I went into fear. Well, I still have the fear, you know, like I make my living, leading retreats in Kauai and teaching at Esalen and then touring my shows. So I went into financial, like what's going to happen, how I pay yeah. the bills, all that. And um, that still is for me, will rise and I'll feel the fear grip me. And then what I do and what I've been doing now is just kind of like, mm sitting with it, breathing with it. And so many teachers I've, you know, had that I've met at Esalen from Miranda McPherson to Jeff Foster, who've taught these beautiful mindfulness practices of just being with that grief, being with that fear. And I also like to write and express it and move it too. So yeah. I feel very lucky to have uh, tools. I always make fun of that word tools, but I find those tools come in handy when you're in that, in that place of not knowing and great uncertainty. The other thing that came right initially when this all began was I had this creative idea for the last two and a half years. I will talk about it. It's called Happy Cock Church. And I, I had sat on it because, you know, I felt, oh, this is scary to put this out there. And the whole reason for putting out a, a, a title of a church is a non-religious church online where we minister to one another with our stories. And I chose the cock because here on Kauai, they've flown the coop, the roosters, and they're running wild everywhere. <laughs> and I found out in the spiritual tradition, the, the cock, the rooster, is really about coming out of darkness to a period of light. And I thought, well, what a better time to rise and shine. And than now but i had so much fear in putting it out because people said and it's so triggering you know people don't like church and the word cock can be triggering and even the word happy can be triggering so yes i thought you know what when we trigger each other like we're doing we're a country that's divided 
people stop listening. So if I could, my dream was, and it's happening now, but I was scared, you know, to put it out there was to create this place where we could all listen deeply, even though we may have different beliefs, beliefs religious, political, you name it, because we're all so unique. And I wanted a place for us to minister to each other, not religious ministry, reverent and irreverent. Oh. Reverent and irreverent, and through sharing our stories, right? It's all about sharing our stories. That's how we connect. That's how we. That's how we really see ourselves in another. And I saw that so many times. I mean, that's what I do when I come to Esalen. There have these circles, these writing circles, and like, why not do it online? And that intimacy is created. I was like, is it going to work online? But it works, and it's beautiful to hear people share these fears, and then sometimes just like outrageous comedy like things that they'll do or think and say it's all just it's there online or in a circle with human beings where we just connect deeply to one another oh. that's phenomenal and that's on well is it still on sundays saturdays and sundays <laughs> saturdays and sundays what time uh it's a uh, different time so it's uh, sorry it's um 11 a.m pacific time and 1 p.m pacific time in uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And you can go to happycockchurch.com, but it'll tell you everything. Uh, so what have you but been... it was a great amount of fear, Greg. It was just fear. I didn't want to put it out there because what will, and I think many people have this happening to them right now in the pandemic, that they'll feel this urge for creative expression or to do something and they like, I'm so scared. What, what are people going to think? And I understand that fear. Anytime you're about to do something or launch into something, that is brand new for you, that fear can be gripping. Oh. Very gripping, yeah. It's almost debilitating sometimes. So yeah. what have you found with people sharing their stories? I mean, you must have been, you must be hearing a lot of stories. And yeah, what, how has the experience been? What, what are people sharing without you know, giving away? I mean, well, obviously if they're sharing it, they're sharing it, so yeah. Well, you know, everybody has different points of view. Like I have people in the church that have different points of view about wearing the mask right and so they'll vent some people really when they read there's a lot of anger and passion other times people are like hey whatever the, you know kind of like a more but the fact that people can sit there and listen and not attack one another they're just listening to that person's point of view mm -hmm. i see that right away empathy empathy is created because it it doesn't become about the idea so much as here's a human being behind this and understanding where they're coming from when we can understand where somebody comes from their perspective then there's not that shame and blame and so what i see is people's hearts opening i see people learning to listen better and and kindness and compassion and i also see people you know letting go of shame you know in this pandemic oh my god i've gone through how many boxes of uh gluten-free ding-dongs right and some people i know are like masturbating to internet porn just you know really out of control so um and alcohol addiction all that so we come sometimes when we write about oh my god i i just been binge eating for like five days straight and they'll write about that and then there's a sharing that goes on and it's very very beautiful Wow, you mean to tell me there's something like gluten-free ding-dongs out Yes, more? there are. Get out. Do you, do you want me to show you the box right now, Greg? It's called Heavenly Cakes. Of course, we want to see the box. <laughs> <laughs> the you know, it makes sense that there would be gluten-free things like that. I just never imagined. I mean, I grew up on ding-dongs and ho-hos. I mean, maybe so many other folks yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Um, wow, well, that sounds very... Um, that sounds very deep and also something that offers levity. And I think that a lot of people right now are looking for levity as they confront things within themselves, within society. You know, I mean, this is sort of a time. Um, you know, I'm also asking people, what do you feel like the lesson this time is attempting to teach us? Uh, I think number one lesson is, can I just sit with the, sit with the moment? I mean, that's the one teaching me over and over again, because I'll feel that anxiety rise or the fear rise or like, I got to do something now. And can I just be with that? Like over and over again, this practice of not trying, trying to run from the feeling to trying to avoid the feeling with the gluten-free ding dong, which hello, I've done, I don't know how many times. So can I just be with that uncertainty? 
you know, we're, we're used to being in control. I'm used to being in control, knowing when my next gig is or when the next, you know, I'm going to have a retreat. And when you're not in control, it, it's like, okay, I'm just with myself. And how can I, how can I be with this, this, uh, these feelings that are uncomfortable? And I think also just my meditation practice is, uh, is I've gotten, you know, I'm like, this is the only way. Get back on the cushion, Anne. Get back on the cushion. Yeah, I can relate to that. I mean, I'm up to like an hour a day. And still, even with that, it's very interesting because I ran like a marathon today with, um, from, with fear. Like I had to do something. I had to, you know, it was like totally in like, I couldn't sit still like, I, like an hour after my meditation. And I'm like, well, this is very interesting <laughs> that, you know, that yeah. I meditated. And I was totally fine during it. And then my mind, you know, it's like the mind kind of knows you're kind of onto it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Something. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so yeah. it's it, like a battle, right? It's like this continual battle. <laughs> it's like, wow, you're persistent, you interesting mind you. Um, I saw what you were going to say just then, Greg. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're both writers. So, yeah, you know, so. Um, Campbell says, have no fear now, you'll all, you are all that I have. And then put a donut icon on Facebook. Thank you, Patty, for tuning in. Selena, thank you for tuning in. Michael, thank you for tuning in. Uh, folks, if you have any questions for us or your thoughts on, on what you're even learning and how you find levity during this unique time, please share it with us. I'm sure the community would love to know. Um, what other aha moments have you had? Uh, had there been anything that would, was really like, oh, wow, like, you know, between the pandemic and the racial injustice that we were becoming more aware of? I'm curious, like, um, were there yeah. like big aha moments for you? Well, I love the aha moments. I love that the word ha is in the aha moments. That means there's humor in there, but the ah initially is ah. Oh! Or that's the way I interpret it. And I, I kind of think that's the way life is. The aha moment is, oh, and then ha ha. So um, I think, uh, every, once again, every day there's an aha moment in that regard. But I think I was really surprised about um, in the pandemic. Well, there's so many things. Is Also, I have my mom. It'll make me just get emotional. She's in a nursing home in Ohio, and I can't see her. And I usually see her three or four times a week. And I don't know if this, it's not really an aha moment, but just feeling that connection of being able to speak to her through uh, on, on the Facebook, on through the connection of there and, yeah. and, and feeling uh, that, I guess that's not so much, but the grief that is there, but also the, the love that is expressed gets deeper in this time. And I think I find that, uh, or talking to other people that they're expressing how much that relationship means to them. They're speaking out loud how they feel. And that's a beautiful thing. And I, I find that, I mean, my mom and I've always shared, but I, I just feel even more closer, closer. Yeah. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think this time is an opportunity for us to really reveal and, and share with others what's really what is really so, you know? Um, yeah, this seems like this is a time when everything is like the lid is blown off. It's like, you know, like what's true and real, that's supposed to be out there. And we're being given an opportunity to accept it, whether it's our own, you know, our own quote unquote stuff or the world at large, like what's going on in society. Yeah, it seems like that's the time. It's very yeah. interesting. Um, you touch upon grief and loss in, in a lot of your work and also shame. And I, I want to talk about that in a moment, but I wanted to share something that I think um, those who are tuning in would really enjoy. Um, I'm going to share my screen and share this video that Anne made. And yeah. we'll be back. It's a few minutes. It's called Shameful Flower. And um, here we go. What do you got? This is poor Hila Hila. If it feels disturbed, it will close up. Poor Hila Hila. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, a flower that can be triggered. Yeah. 
it made me think of you. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. <laughs> because I trigger people. No, because you care about shame. I care about shame. And I know that triggers, even though nobody likes to be triggered, that's, that's kind of like the doorway to shame. Oh, I triggered it, and it goes into shame. The shameful flower. And, and when we're triggered, we stop listening. Like if you hear the word cock, you're triggered. You hear the word church, you're triggered. Yeah, I might feel triggered if I heard those words too. Like the word cock brings up sometimes shame for people. You have to Okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye. That's what Steve Allman says that the path to truth runs through shame. I really love that. Hmm. And I think the path to truth also runs through if you're being triggered, really looking at what's triggering me and investigating that. Like, what triggers you? I get triggered at dinner sometimes. You do. I don't know if I get quiet though. But maybe I close up. I kind of get mad too. You do get mad. Yeah. And when you're triggered and you get mad or you get silent, you stop listening. Yes. Yeah. You know. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Thanks, Greg. Wow. Oh wow. Wow. That is this amazing. Is that is absolutely amazing. So yeah. yeah, congratulations on that. I was watching that, I was going, this is brilliant. This is really awesome. Yeah. Oh, that thank really you. Um so you, you do talk about grief, loss, shame in, in your work. Um, can you talk about that more? Not some, I mean, you could talk about the grief, loss, shame, but, uh, but why was it um, important for you to include that in your creative process? I think because I, well, I just had so many losses in my life, so many failures, so many, um, just where I've hit rock bottom over and over again. And I saw how important it was for me to express it was really what brought me back to life or it's like the Phoenix rising from the ashes over and over again. It's like that need to express and speak about it is really what saved me. And like, I'm, I'm thinking about a time in when, you know, and also I was around such uh, growing up and, of just poverty and people that were dis, you know, disadvantaged. When I went to college, I couldn't afford college unless I got a job. So I got a job living in a state mental hospital for four years. And I was with the chronic schizophrenic population. I got free room and board in exchange for writing plays. But this was the bottom of the barrel of state mental hospital. And I saw such immense loss there and, and grief in, in the, the people that stayed there, the residents whose families never came to visit. So I feel like I was like put up against at 18 years old from an innocent kind of place to like, bam, this is like people suffer greatly. And then in, in Los Angeles, uh, working in a homeless shelter for 10 years uh, with a homeless mentally ill, I lived there. And so I saw a lot of grief. And at that time, I was also trying to make it in showbiz. And, uh, and I, uh, for the longest time, my journey has been telling other people's stories because I didn't think my own story mattered. I'd see people <laughs> in tremendous hardships. And yet I was having loss after loss, but I think a lot of people out there listening feel like, well, this person's story is way, they've gone through so much more than I have. Who am I to speak my truth? Who am I to tell my story? Mm. And for my whole journey, it's been like, no, and remove the mask. I love that quote by is it roomy? Tear off your mask. Your face is glorious. And I think we hide. And I think this pandemic, I think everything that's happened, we're forcing to remove the mask. And my own artistic path has been removing that mask because look, I see the suffering, the immense suffering. I see my own suffering. Yeah, I can't speak about it because I think, oh, who am I? So my first thing would be like, 
speak about it. And Loveland, the show that I wrote in the one, I've done many shows, but this last, no, the second to last one was about my mother dying. Now this is morbid, my mother had not died yet. But I thought, well, that will be the last that'll finally like, ah, uh, because my dad had just died. I had lost this, I was in New York with Mel Brooks doing my show and uh, it was supposed to go last like for a year and then a movie and then Anne Bancroft died. My dad, all these losses, the show closed. I was back out like at square one again. It was like, it was tumbling blocks like, okay, now what? And so I wrote about the very thing that I was fearing next. What would be the next shoe that would drop? Would be my, my mom, like if all this happened, I, I don't know if I'd make it. So I wrote about that. So I faced the fear by writing about it. And my mom saw the show where I made her dead. She's like, I'm not dead yet. You know, I had her eulogy on stage and everything. And this is dark comedy. So I do a lot of comedy, but there's a lot of pain in there. And the, the comedy is coming from truth. My own truth of fears and about being alone in the world and, and being destitute. And that's where I was at that point. Like no sense of belonging, unrootedness. Mm -hmm. All these feelings were coming up. And so I just put them and faced them head on. But other people would say, well, you know, compared to somebody that's homeless and mentally ill, somebody losing their mother, everybody loses their mother. And that's what the voice I would tell myself. But no, I had to listen to that voice. It's like, hey, this matters to me. This matters to me. And I'm going to write it for myself. Wow. Oh. Did she like the eulogy? She loved it. You loved it. <laughs> I also made her a cigarette smoking alcoholic. I exaggerated her. And my mother has a great sense of humor. And she, she loved it. That is wild. I was going to ask you, you know, when you were younger, growing up, um, were you always somebody that was humorous? Or did you always want to perform? I mean, uh, was there a particular person that really inspired you? You were like, oh, okay, that's the path I want to take. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely Carol Burnett. And then it became uh, Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock were the later on, but Carol Burnett was it because I like playing characters. You know, like I like playing the new ager who comes to Esalen and teaches meditation. You know, I like like <laughs> riffing on people, you know? And um, so yeah, I was drawn to, I, my goal was Saturday Night Live. So that's also been my evolution from going to big wild characters to stripping down to myself, but not that I still don't do an awful lot of comedy. And I was in trouble. I was a class clown and I was also president of our church youth group just so I could win the talent show. Fascinating. Well, that's so I have both things. <laughs> it's wild. Wow. Yeah. Two, yeah. like, almost polar opposites, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have actually a question. Uh, McGilly writes us and says, if you want to write your story and you are on your own with two children in social distancing, any suggestions on how to sit down and start? Yeah. Well. I'm going to plug Happy Cock Church because it's free. You can come be in community and write with us every Saturday and Sunday. The other thing is I want to speak to you. People think they have to have a chunk of time to write. And you know what? When you get a little break, even 10 minutes, just put down on that piece of paper what I really want to say is dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Like, don't feel like you have to carve out this huge chunk of time. I understand that not having time. I write shows in between 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, 10 minutes there. And just grab that time and sit down and just stream of consciousness, start writing what is up for you. And if you did that, you'd start to see there's themes every day that start to appear that are part of a larger story. It would start to inform you. So you're really listening to what wants to come through you rather than, okay, I'm gonna write this. You're listening for what really wants to emerge. Oh. I hope that helps. McGilly, so yeah, um, McGilly, I also saw one of your shows. She's, um, I think it's a, uh, it's a great show, was the comment. Um, <laughs> Mary says, I want to write more. Um, and Mary, yeah, and Mary says yes. So <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. I like how you put it um, where you don't need like this, you don't necessarily need like this huge chunk of time. Like you could be doing it like in between things. Like I think um, for me as a creative person, I get caught up with, you know, I've done a lot of creative work in the past and I think, well, you know, like I have to have this huge expanse of time, like months ahead of me, like open space. And I don't 
necessarily think that's true anymore. I mean, and, and then you kind of mirrored back to me some of the re recent realizations I was having. And I like that you say, like, you can take 10 minutes and, and what did you say? Like, what I really want to say is, yeah. and write it down. Yeah. That's yeah. And, and the other go-to is I remember. Just put I remember and watch what comes up. If, either one of those two. I like to do what I really want to say is when I'm like in a really high state of emotion. That asshole did blah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but what I really want to say, or is I'm sad because so-and-so just walked in the door and said blah, blah, right? Yeah. And triggers, we're back to the trigger, the pool of heat. What triggers you? Watch what triggers you. That's a gold mine there. Because if you're triggered, there's a lot of, it's a wound that needs to be healed. Oh, isn't yeah. it though? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. 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 Have you found that unless you really kind of pay attention to like that trigger, that it gets louder and louder and louder until you're ready to like go, okay, I surrender. Like, what is it? You know, like what? Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to, ex I love the Michael Montaigne quote, I'm pronouncing, badgering his name, but an unexamined life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. We have to examine our lives. We have to like say, okay, why did this trigger me? Can I explore this? Can I investigate it? Can I look at this? If people are all around, we got to change the world. We got to change. The we have to change ourselves. And that's with self-examination. Truly. Okay. Definitely. Uh, yeah. What do you find um, <clears throat> have been people's, um, biggest stum not stumbling blocks or resistance, like in the workshops you teach, um, is there a common theme or yeah. theme that you often see like from folks when you suggest like exercises or whatever? I'm curious like yeah. what the common theme might be like where people are trying to overcome. Or well, move the, first one, the first one will be that your story matters, that the tendency to compare to other stories in comparison kills creativity and you compare you you're saying that person's story is more worthy or better or they've been through bigger hardships or blah 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 then you just kill that creative impulse right then and there so you have to really nurture that seed in you that knows that you want to speak this truth that this story must come out the other thing that that happens is that I'll have students think, oh, it'll be years before I get the craft of writing. It'll be years before I can really, you know, speak in a way that is my voice. And I can say from leading these workshops that by day two, you hear people's voice. It's there. The voice is always there, but the voice is never not there. What happens is that you censor yourself a layer and layer and layer and layer. But the workshop or if you're not in a workshop, it's just like, how many layers can I remove? Because watch where you want to play it safe. Do not play it safe mm -hmm. at all. And that takes more than anything permission. You're giving yourself permission to like be as wildly out of control, unbet all those thoughts that you don't want anybody to know, the ones that you're trying to cover down, not let anybody see, those are the ones you're going to let want to rise up. And so I see people struggle with that of what will people think? What will my mother think if I write about her in this way? Will I lose my mother? Will I lose my family? Will, and there are risks to take when you write about family members and ex-lovers, right? There's that chance like they're still in my life. They could shun me. So it's a risk. So I see that come up. Why wow, I'm going to wait till they're dead. But I'm like, no, if it's coming up now, you write about it now. And later you can decide whether you want it to go to the print or get it out in the world. But the most important thing is if it's arising this very moment, you put it out in, on your page, whether you share it with anybody, that's one thing, but just get it out. Yeah, yeah, it's really great to hear that. I've had, um, <clears throat> I've had that come up and I thought I should wait because you know some of it's family related and but then, but it's also like darkly comedic and wonderfully kind of perversely edu educational in some ways. It's like, yeah. so I think, uh, I think, you know, just in hearing you, I, um, I can totally relate to that. And, um, yeah, so you, you are, you are offering me an opportunity to give myself permission to let that out. Yeah. yeah. And you're right. You can decide later if you want it to go to print, but to, to right. let it Yeah. You can't. And it's also permission to be bad. Like, oh my God, I just write crap, 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 crap. And 
and that's another thing. People are like, nothing's coming out. Well, hello, you have to just show up and write an awful lot. And even having to me, like what I would say, crap writing, there's still, the seeds are in there and I use those seeds. So it's never for not, it's all good just to show up on that page. Yeah. And I'm also thinking about the, cause I'm a solo performer, the anthology for solo performance is called Extreme Exposure by Joe Bonney, edited by Joe Bonney. And I don't think one person that's been a solo performer artist went and got a degree in creative writing. In fact, most of them didn't even go to college. They're just speaking their truth. So the idea that you have to have this master's or PhD, that is not true. It's just unlocking your own voice by removing the mask, yeah. giving yourself permission and yeah. time. Yeah. And it's refreshing. You don't necessarily need a you know, masters to, <laughs> to venture. Yeah. yeah, we are our own best story, right? Yeah, we're yeah. a walking story, yes. We're like walking, constantly evolving. Um, Mary asks, uh, how do you feel about journaling and poetry? Oh my gosh, Mary, well, I love journaling and poetry and I get inspired by poetry because, you know, the few words that uh, are on that page, <laughs> I mean, what is not spoken and what it leaves for your imagination. I, I, and I'm not a poet, Mary, but I read poetry every day. I love, of course, Mary Oliver, and I, I love John O'Donohue, and I read David White and I, Ellen Bast. And so I like to read, I like to read the sonnets. I, well, I'm just crazy but about uh, reading, but I don't know anything to write it, but I am inspired by it. And, and journaling and poetry, writing anything that's going to uh, just allow the words to flow, the creative expression, it's, it's gold. And, and this is the other thing. I read this book called Journal Keeper. It was a book, and I don't know if that's such a great title, The Journal Keeper, but it's a, she wrote about, she was writing a journal about her mother and her mother's death. And she said, I'm just gonna write these journal notes. And then when my mom dies, I'll take the journal notes and turn it into a book. Well, the actual journal notes became the book. And it was like, I, I could not keep turning. It was so riveting. So you take the journal notes and there's no difference to me because it will either be a source material that'll lead to whatever you want to put out there or it'll also itself be a work of art. It's beautiful. That book was beautiful. It was just journal entries. Mm, what's it called again? The Journal Keeper. The Journal Keeper. Yeah. Yeah. The Journal Keeper, folks. Write that down. Um, yeah, I've often found too when I, you know, I have like, as, as I guess many writers do, many journals, and I often refer back to them, and there's just so much material in there. I mean, you can take and pluck and go off with that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you love most about what you do? And whether it be, what do you love most about teaching and being in that component? And what do you love most about being on stage? Well, I love most in teaching is watching uh, students like surprise themselves and and mm -hmm. and and unfold like I feel like it's like those flowers like they come in like here and then like yeah. at the end they're like these these beautiful flowers of, of expression and and watching that is to me is just pure beauty to see a student trust their creative impulse and then not hide it but then to share it and and take risks, the tremendous, this is something that has been, the tremendous courage it takes to put something on the page or to speak it out, like takes immense courage. So watching the bravery of people put their work out there and just, even if it's just sharing with one other person, that's a huge risk of what are people gonna think? And so I get excited watching the risks that are taken, the surprises and the beauty that comes with owning your creative expression. And as far as my own performing and being, I love being on stage. I love performing. I love the feeling of like, like getting the biggest laugh and then pulling the carpet out under and sinking to the depths. Of, I love, I love navigating the ride on stage, writing it and also performing it. Like being able to hold an audience like right there and to go, bam, you know, yeah. I can't even explain it, but it's like a, it's like a, it's super fun. Cause you're like playing, you're just you're playing with energy out there and you're in a conversation with that audience. And so you can feel them holding and then you can, it's this beautiful dance that's happening. And uh, 
and it makes me, you know, my mind goes a mile a minute, but on stage, when I'm in it, it's like this, this spaciousness. It's like, a, it's like, wow, there's so many ways. I, the moment slows down mm. and it's, uh, it's, it's like, I'm in love with it. Oh. On nights where I don't bomb. <laughs> <laughs> on nights where you don't <laughs> yeah, I mean, every, every, every now and then. I mean, most of the time it's not bombing, but I've definitely had, I did a show one time. I was just working out. Oh, this is the other thing I want to say to people starting out. Hello, you're going to bomb. Hello, you're going to have sucky <laughs> nights. You're going to just horrible. And I had the show in New York that Mel Brooks produced. And I was coming um, to do my new show, Loveland at the Marsh in San Francisco. And I was on stage and I had tons of people come to see it because Squeezebox was a huge hit. And so I had all these students, I had bands out there and I go to do it and it's an 80 minute solo show. And first three minutes, nobody's laughing. Next five minutes, nobody's laughing. It's like death on stage, just death. It's like the sweat, like I'm bombing. And afterwards, you know, somebody came up to me and said, oh, and the lighting was nice. And then another student came up and said, oh, it's so cool to see my teacher fail on stage. <laughs> oh and my gosh, it. wow. It I'm laughing about it, but I was in the dressing room just crying. I did not want to go out the next night. It was the shame that I felt from bombing and it was so intense. And I didn't want to go back out there, of course, because now the next night I'm going to go out there. Because on that night, I find out that certain major things are not working. And luckily for my director, Joshua, he said, and the script is working, but you're not there as a performer yet. And the only way that you're going to get there is to go back on, on stage the next night and practice in front of a live audience. So I had to bomb every single night. Uh, that's why they have previews. And so what happened was my suck level was from got less and less and less. Every night my suck level got less. And I got that suck level from Heather Woodbury, but it's such a great, great phrase. And then Tavis Smiley has that book called Fail Up. Yes. So you're failing up every night. You're, you, but the shame of that, Greg, is it's not pretty. <laughs> and, and then that show went on to win Best Solo Show in San Francisco and LA. But the first weeks of it were brutal, hell. And look, I'll have people that'll never come see me again because they're like, oh, I saw that show, it was horrible. Right? It changed and evolved because I practiced. I practiced. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice. <laughs> um, have you, there's, a, we have another question for you. I love that. And I love the marsh, you know, uh, the marsh. Yeah. So folks, yeah. Look, look it up. It's, it's a brilliant um, venue and there's so, there's so much stuff going on. It's there. a solo show mecca. Yeah. 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 It totally is. Um, and I, pardon me if I don't get this name correctly, but Anandache, Anandache says, have you dealt with feelings of disempowerment during the pandemic or are you able to hold an inspired perspective or both? Does feeling disempowered ever feed your inspiration? That's a great question. Yes, I have definitely felt disempowered during this thing that I like, I've, I've, I, you know, I'm telling you, your story matters. Go out there and do it. But I'll go through periods during this. Does my voice, if I speak about this subject or what's occurring, does, is it really going to make? And then I do. I just start with that. I start with where I am. Like, if I go back into that question, and I think we're always going back and forth from possibility into doubt, possibility into doubt. So I will write about my own doubt. I will m also move it. I'm a, somebody that likes to get up and write on my feet and start moving. Mm. So what I mean by that is like, I will let myself physically get into that place of disempowerment, like, like a movement, like, oh, ah, oh. and then write and move in that place because that's what's showing up right now. I'm not like, I'm excited for you because you're out there and you're thinking about writing your story. And I know it is the thing to do, but I know you're going to go through periods where you feel disempowered because I do. And then I write through that as well. You write, I don't feel like doing anything today. Nothing matters. What does it really matter? I don't care. Mm. So when you do that, you start to then drop into something else, but you have to address it where you are, which is like, if you're like, screw the world, who cares? I want to die, blah, blah, put that on the page. 
And I'm going to tell you something else will be uncovered there. Yeah. It's when you resist it. When you resist it, then you're in trouble. Right, right. What would you say to, to performers or writers who have reached us? You know, I'm, I'm saying this for a perfectly selfish reason. <laughs> who, have, who have reached like a certain plateau, like they've had this sort of luscious thing over there and they've kind of, and, and they can tell that their work has kind of gotten to a plateau and now it's time to move forward. And I don't know, they have some of those thoughts that you just said, like, I don't feel like doing it or I'm tired. I've done all that. I have to keep going. Oh my God. You know, like, um, I probably know the answer to it or we probably know the answer to that, but what would you say to that? Well, there's, there's a couple of things I'd say to that. I think, um, of course, I'd say right around that, but there's also a thing of one is exhausted and one needs rest and mm. one needs to unplug from if you've been making your living in a certain way and you feel burnt out and you feel like, and I think that's a beautiful thing that's happened to some people in the pandemic is they just, they just stopped. And right before this uh, pandemic occurred in uh i came all motivated i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to this greg but what you're talking about which is all hell-bent on putting happy cock church out creating this new kind of show format and i carved out four months not taking any gigs to do it and yet nothing could come out mm. i was burnt out i was exhausted from being on the road i was like I was like, I just need to walk Hanalei Bay. I just need to walk in beauty. I, and poetry, David White's book really helped me, which is like midlife and the great unknown, finding poetry and courage to get through this next step. And it doesn't matter if you're midlife, doesn't matter if you're a 20 year old, that book, it was very helpful because it was all about maybe you just need to listen and what arrives in your field rather than you going out and making shit happen what comes and what arrives to you and letting your body just rest your mind rest and then what happened the curiosity came back oh i think i want to write about this thing but i i thought the rest was so necessary and it follows the laws of nature which i also got from my director joshua which is which is release create rest, release, create rest, release, create rest. And it's really hard to create when you're in burnout. So my first thing would be, can you rest? And if you feel rested and you're like reached a plateau, um, it goes to curiosity then. What is pulling me? Not what do I want to do, how I'm going to make my mark next, but what am I what seems to be arriving in my field that is drawing me to it? Mm. Boy, that's beautifully put. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, somebody asked David White poetry. Is it David White? Yeah. Yes. And the book is called Midlife in the Great Unknown. Midlife in the Great Unknown. That sounds like a fascinating book. You know, I purposely plotted out my midlife crisis when I was 23 just to get it out of the way, but I had no idea that 20 something years later, I would be going through it again. It's like, <laughs> I don't it. It's like a recurring one or that I extended it 20 years. I don't know. It's very interesting. Um, well, we have a few minutes left here, folks. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them in the feed. Everyone, thank you for your comments. Like more than 36 comments this is awesome. And um, people are sharing the feed as well. Um, do you feel creativity is is a wonderful thing to offer levity during these times or in between our own introspective moments now? Yes, it's the way. It is the way. I mean, we are all born creative. We are creative beings and that expression, whether it's, you know, creating a lovely meal or creating a flower arrangement or writing your story or we we thrive when we create and... So finding that within you, setting some time, you know, you, every moment could be creative. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not that person. I would like to be that person. But uh, can, I, can I just nurture, nurture that part of me that has that impulse and the self-doubt and the negative and the critical voices? Well, I turn them into characters. 
that will help you if your critical voice is acting up, just turn it into character or create an alter ego and give it a voice. And then it, it gives humor to it. So it's like, you know, you're just a no good, whatever it is. It's like, you never show up on time. You never finish a project. What's wrong with you? Right. If I create a character like that, that's my internal voice, then it'll crack me up and it takes away that charge of the, you're not doing enough, Anne, you know? Yeah. It's an exaggeration that will help you deal with, number one, that's the other problem people have. They let that inner critic stop them. So you have to, you have to, you're going to hit resistance. You are going to hit resistance. And what are you going to do? You're going to move through it. You're going to say, hello, resistance. There you are again. And I'm showing up anyway. Right, right. Um, Catherine, thank you for that. Um, Catherine asks, is there a favorite book about humor that you recommend uh, for those of us who are not quote unquote naturals? Ah, well, Catherine, we're all natural. We got to do down. <laughs> I love you, but uh, you know, most of the books, I, I don't have a book that is good on humor because to me, the best humor comes from pain. Like it's coming from like, to, for me, like, out of that darkness is coming the humor so the best books for me are how can i tap into that darkness <laughs> and then underneath it then the humor will come out but i'm trying to think like if you think about i'm trying to give you a good example if you think about uh, mary tyler moore where she goes to the funeral of the clown that is dying and everybody's serious and she starts getting the giggles it's so inappropriate but classic is it classic <laughs> i mean, look at that mary tyler moore episode of, um of can i find the funny in this moment that is just so tragic like uh and so you're actually you can you can start to train your mind to look is there something funny in this very moment of this person dying and that episode of mary tyler moore was actually a really good example of that um I think I might post that in the feed just because, yeah, I will. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing, post the Rumi poem because the Rumi, I dressed up as Rumi. Oh, wait. And the message that. of we? that was tear off your mask. Your face is glorious. And uh, we can show that, can't we? Well, if you want, but I don't. You sent that to me, correct? Yeah. It's such a, it's such a thing about stepping into your of who you are no longer hiding and, and being you okay. i think that's the pandemic more than anything is just be you just be you, you. Do not to do anything but be you and I'm people gonna, keep like i'm in war so. i'm gonna show this finding freedom with Rumi. yeah this to us i'm gonna screen share and then we'll come back with just i got a few more questions for you and, okay um, we'll, this i shot in hanalei bay in Kauai, and um it, it's uh it's two minutes or maybe less but it's you get to see beautiful Hanalei Bay and Kauai and this is where I live yeah <laughs>
Yeah, the sound was a little off on it, but it's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I, you know, this is so, uh, this is, this is great. I, this is so well needed. <laughs> what, a way to, what a way to begin a week. I feel so in, enlivened and just like, just in power. This is so, um, this is so cool. Um, oh. Folks, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, Michelle says, be you, aloha from Oahu. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Um, Somebody asked, there's a video of you in your bathtub. Yeah, there is. Just for, I'm going to be doing more bathtub videos. Yeah, well, and there'll be a Happy Clock Church. But sending it to me before we part, I will show that on the way out. <laughs> um, so the bathtub video, yeah. Up to you, up to you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Asha. Um, or I'll post it afterward. Um, yeah. But I have a few more questions for you. Um, and these are sort of... Uh, sort of esalen centric questions, um, and you'll, you'll understand why when you hear them. Uh, what brings you a real sense of wonder and awe? Oh, nature, just being up close with nature. And uh, that'd be the first one is just, I could just, uh, just the beauty, the beauty. And wonder and awe also, I do feel it tremendously with students when I see them like just unfold, I feel that wonder and awe. I feel it with music, tremendous music too. I'm a big uh, Astro Piazzolla fan and his music just gets me. So wonder, Beethoven mm -hmm. too, yeah. Awesome, that's beautiful. Um, how has your work helped you expand your human potential? Well, look, I'm teaching people to write their story, but for the longest time, I'm wearing my own mask, so I'm teaching what I need to learn and practice myself. So I, I think uh, teaching has helped me definitely become uh, more integrated, more myself, more what I'm teaching people, I've been practicing on myself. So. Right on, right on. Uh, one last question for you. What's the most interesting thing you have been learning about yourself lately? Wow, what's the most interesting learning thing I'm learning about myself lately? Oh, uh, that it's okay that I work in a certain way that I wait till the last minute. <laughs> I usually shame myself, but that I guess I'm learning that um, it works. You put the work out and it's not a normal method of, but it seems to work for me, uh, Greg. Maybe that's it, that it happens. Being less uh, like that around the way I create, which seems to be like a, in a binge. Mm. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Mm, so great. Uh, you know, Anne, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to connect with you today. It just was so wonderful. And thank you for sharing all the things that you shared about your life, your work, this time, the videos, uh, they're great. I think uh, that you showing up and being creative gives us an opportunity to show up and be creative. And that certainly offers us a, a really wonderful possibility of levity during a lot of uncertainty as we all move forward together in this unique time in history. So really, thank you for being here. Thank you, Greg, so much for this interview and, and letting me share about storytelling and, and speaking your truth and and look you can come for free to happy cock church i'll be there like shepherding you and cheerleading you to speak your story so that's that's uh happycockchurch.com yeah on sundays different time zones different times but it's 11 a.m pacific yeah on sundays um you can follow ann on youtube great videos there visit annrandolph.com a n a-N-N, -N, not an E after it, annrandolph.com. And uh, you can find out more about what Ann is up to and um, inquire within. I like that, inquire within. I, should, I want a t-shirt that says inquire within. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. Inquire within. I want a t-shirt. T-shirt's like, unmute yourself. No. <laughs> unmute yourself, yes. Unmute yourself, because that's what's crazy right now. It's like, I'm, I'm afraid when I meet real people, it, out on the street and they're soft spoken. I'm gonna go, oh, mute yourself. <laughs> yeah, imagine if we just all did that for like a day or something, you know? I know. Unmute yourself. And thank you so much 
Uh, folks, check it out Thank on you. the web. Stay in touch with us at slin.org slash learn. Uh, lots of blogs, lots of things coming up there so you can keep track of what we're up to. Uh, check in with us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. We're here. We want to hear your stories. We want to share things with you. So share things with us. And um, and thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Super fun, Greg. Yeah. And, in, and until next time, folks, I'm Greg Archer, and you've been tuning in to the Esalen interview. Um, stay happy and well, and we'll see you soon.